Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed speaker of this evening. He has been a, member, a major code contributor of Postgres since 1999 by a shy answer. Who's even been working in this IT sector since that long? Actually, it's a pretty healthy number, but it's still a minority of the room. He's been a developer consultant for Second Quadrant, as well as a member of the Postgres Global Development Core team. Please welcome Peter Eisentraut. Wow, thank you. Um, nice turnout. Uh, next time we gotta come earlier. That's what we were on today. Um, so yes, uh, a lot of knowledgeable people in here. Thank you for coming out. Uh, see a couple familiar faces and a couple familiar t-shirts. Um, who here is a Postgres user already? Okay, okay, it's about half. Okay, cool. So, yes, Eric introduced me. I'm Peter. Um, I I live in Pennsylvania on the just the eastern side, just across the border from New Jersey. So I have some of the day trip up here. And I, you know, want to talk about uh, how how does Postgres actually work? Now, you know, maybe those of you who didn't come tonight don't want to know. <laughs> But I, I, I think it's it's useful to look a little bit into the internals because if you you know if you're probably a DBA or a developer or, or someone who works with Postgres and is somehow responsible for for a Postgres database perhaps uh, and you know if you have issues or things don't go the way you want them to go sometimes it's useful to know how, how things actually work a little bit under under the surface just to get some context for your problems and it helps you understand better. As opposed to just, you know, it doesn't work. I don't know what to do. So that's what I want to talk about. So, so I'm going to talk about my employer a little bit because we're sponsoring tonight. Um, so I work for a company called Second Quadrant. We are basically a Postgres uh, development and services shop. We We've been in business for more than 10 years, and we have, you know, we're a global company where we have more than, probably more than, 70 now we've been growing quite a bit so we have you know quite a bit more than 50 staff in 25 countries probably now they just hired a couple people there yesterday so I just have to keep updating this and we, we offer production support 24 7 so uh, you know, whenever you have a problem even in the middle of the night we have someone maybe on the other side of the globe who's awake can help you and we do consulting and we contribute to Postgres development that's my uh, one of my main jobs to actually write Postgres code. So that, that's what we do. Uh, we have a, a conference coming up. Uh, so if you want to you know, do more after tonight, it's just it's here in New York, and we have a second chapter in, in Chicago just uh, uh, in just over a month. So if you want to just look at uh, take those uh, dates down, uh, it's going to be at the New York one. It's just going to it's going to be at the New Yorker Hotel. Just couple blocks from there, so it's easy, really easy to get to. So there's going to be uh, one day of training on the 6th and on the 7th just uh, one day of uh, Postgres talks. So yeah. hopefully we'll have uh, more chairs, I'll pass it along. <coughs> so my sort of whimsical subtitle of this is From Courage to Disk and Back Again. It's a reference, maybe someone gets it. But, um, so you know, we write a query, things happen, they hit the disk, and then what happens if you do That's what I, what I want to talk about. Right. Is the volume good here with this thing just that kicked on? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Let me know. I'm a little bit not used to it. holding the microphone like that. So here's a query. And if you can't see it in the back, it's, it's just a query. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, th this is the kind of thing you do all the time. You have a, I took this from sort of a stored sample database, so it has customers, and it has orders, and you just do a little bit of a app on the board. You do some joining, and you do the sums, and some grouping, all that's totally one percent, right? So you type that in, you run it, boom, it's <coughs> right, so like that. And when I tried it, it took 15 milliseconds. Wow. A lot of stuff happened there, right? So, 
I, I checked the other day, Postgres has now almost 950,000 lines of code. So not quite a million, but we'll probably get there in the next year or two. I would expect the way things have been going. So what, what just happened here, right? In 15 milliseconds, you get this query answered, and you have like almost a million lines of code working in the background. So you know, this is sort of a, a report there ordered by which one is the best, best market. So how, how did this happen? So we'll start at the start <laughs> point at the top. Of the <laughs> so you you normally start with using PSQL. Let's see the, the uh, command line tool we had in the quiz just now, right? You have these backslash commands and stuff in there. And uh, at the core, if you sort of really narrow it down, this is kind of what PSQL does as a source code. It's it's huge actually, but this is really it has a little loop. It takes a uh, it takes uh, you know, prints a prompt and you type some, if something in. You press enter and then it checks did you type backslash something. Type backslash q. There's a big switch or if else if else basically. If you type backslash q then x. And if you type backslash l then you get the list of database. And you type backslash d and you do this. But if it's not a backslash anything, then it just passes it on to this pqx for call. Sends it off. PSQL doesn't really know anything about databases. It, it doesn't know what you typed in there. Is, is that an SQL command or does it even make sense? Right? All it really does is if you type something in, is it a backslash some special command? There's some special handling for that. Otherwise, it just sends it off. There's no knowledge on the client about anything that's in your database. That's kind of an important uh, distinction, perhaps, how other systems might work. The client doesn't know what's in your database, it just takes your input sends it off, and you know, then stuff comes back, it prints it out, it makes it look pretty, and that's it. And you, you, know, you don't have to use PSQL, there's other options, like PG Admin and OmniDB, and SQL Studio, and, and other just new, new command line clients out there now. And so you can use anything, it's just, as long as you can kind of do that, it's the same thing. Right? There's nothing really special about PSQL, except that it's a like default thing that's shipped with PSQL. So what happens next? PSQL, this is a command I ran on my system. And PSQL, these are the libraries that PSQL, this will differ obviously from on different systems, but it's more like the idea. So the first library PSQL is linked with is libpq, that's the Postgres library, right? so that is what it uses to communicate. And there's some other stuff, get text library for message translation, read line library for the, the prompting and editing that you use, and then it's a system library. So that's a PSQL app, right? Basically, you just have a couple system libraries and then libpq to do, to communicate with something. Was there a question? So the next step in the chain is, is libpq. And sometimes people ask, why is it called libpq and not pg? That would make more sense. So that's a totally ancient thing. It's in, uh, before SQL was even a thing in Postgres, Postgres had a query language called PostQL. Before SQL was you know, accepted as the mainstream uh, standard database language. So PostQL is where the PQ came from. So there's a lot of really old interfaces in Postgres that, that are somehow PQ, but that's where the variation comes from. So that's why the PQ is why it's also called PQ Connect DB and PQ Exec. But curiously, the, the return structs are PG content. So that's always what used me in our uh, yeah, <laughs> So what libpq does is, is an abstract network network abstraction level, basically. You have these kinds of commands you connect to a database, you run PQ Exec to run a query string. And what libpq basically does is turns this into sort of operating system level network calls, right? It opens the socket, some error checking, it, it takes whatever you did up here, or packs it into some kind of format and sends it off the wire. And it waits until stuff comes back, and then it sort of copies that into its local space and formats it a little bit to pass back. That's what LibTQ does. Right? Again, LibTQ doesn't know about your database or what tables there are. All it does is it takes something from the calling application, sends it off the, to the network, gets whatever back, and sort of 
presents it in sort of some local structs that you can then investigate. The really interesting thing that LibDQ knows is, the, is a protocol. So Postgres uses a custom protocol to communicate between clients and servers. And the reason for that is, again, ancient, basically. It's, you know, Postgres has been around since the 1980s in one way or another, and so this protocol is just a method back then, and we've just been extending it ever since. So, you know, nowadays, we would use some HTTP REST stuff or protocol buffers or things like that to design protocol. But that's what we have. So this is kind of how that looks. And uh, so on the, on the left, I kind of illustrated the client sends stuff to the server at CS, and then SC is what comes back. And these are kind of how these messages are constructed. The first letter, or the first byte in a message, is all a good letter, kind of that kind of explains what the message is. So in the first example, the Q is query. So you, you have a message that sends the query to the backend. And then there's a number, an integer that shows how, how long the message is, so it knows where, you know, where it ends in that network stream. And then you just have the string, and that's it. So it sends Q, a length byte, a length word, I guess, and then um, the string, that's it. Then stuff happens, a lot of stuff happens, and stuff comes back. And then the, the first thing that comes back is the, is the T message. The T is a, a tuple descriptor, I guess. It, it, it describes the format, the format of the, the result row. So it tells you how many, row, how many columns are there, and what are the types, and maybe some other things. And then the data comes back. Those are the D rows of the data rows, and then just from one row after another comes back. And this could, you know, this could be like many rows, and then you just keep setting these D rows. And then the job of LibPQ basically is to take the T message and interpret it and remember it, and then use that information to decode the D rows. Right? So it knows like, okay, there's so many columns that are coming right now, and then I, I know how to take part of these D rows copy all that stuff into the local memory, put it into the, those C structs, and then that, that is what gets returned out of the exit calls, for example, right? So that's basically the job of the two view. And then when, once the, uh, once the, the uh, result set is done, you get a, a Z message, it's, it's sort of end of, end of grill, ready for the next query. And then you can send another Q message if you want, if another query, or if you're done, you just you quit. And then the, the, to create the client is supposed to send a terminate message, that's the X. And maybe if you've seen that, if your client just dies, you get a, 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 a message in the server log that says uh, client, uh, end of client connection, unexpected end of client connection, that's what it says. And that basically <coughs> just means that the client didn't send this X message to shut down the, the exchange. And that's not really a big problem. It just kind of tells you that the, the client died unexpectedly. Maybe there's something wrong in your, in your client code. Uh, it, it's not sort of a big uh, issue for it. So the data consistency or anything like that. So if you want to learn more about the protocol, there's, the protocol, first of all, is documented, right? There's other database systems where the protocol is not documented because they have that kind of sort of trade secret. Um, Postgres documentation contains the full explanation of the protocol. And if you want to play around with that a little bit, so every so often in my job as so support consultant, uh, I have to do that if things don't work. I get out TCP dump, or in more extreme cases, Wireshark, and then just you know, look around. The nice thing about it, Wireshark is it actually knows the Postgres protocol, so if you select one of these many options it has, you can decode protocol, and then it basically shows you that kind of stuff flying by. And then you can kind of see, okay, I run my query, it does, you know, it goes that way, and then maybe for some reason, nothing comes back, or only a few things come back, and then you, you can run the right there. It doesn't happen all that often, but it, it does happen if people have funny network configurations and things like that, but it does happen. So, those are good tools uh, to kind of have handy. So then the next thing that happens once the server receives the query stream is just a big string, right? Select this and this and this, what we saw. It has to par uh, parse it. And that, this is standard stuff. If you have ever dealt with parsing or maybe uh, 
uh, what about compile theory? It's the, it's the standard lexical analysis and parsing with the uh, Lex and Bison. Uh, those are the sort of modern version of Lex and Yak that uh, you know, have been used for parsing for a long time. So this is kind of how that works. It, it takes the string and it has a sort of table of regular expressions internally, and it just looks like, OK, what's the first thing? What's the select? Okay, it knows by keywords. SQL keyword, so it's like, okay, that's a select, we know that. And the next thing is some function called handle, but it doesn't know that yet, so it's just it's an identifier or something. We'll figure out what that is. And then it has a parentheses and something that is a string constant. Okay, so that's just a string constant, and comma, another identifier. Obviously, if you read that, you know that this is going to be a function called some kind, but at this point, it doesn't know that. It just says identifier, some parentheses, comma, another identifier, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that, that's pretty standard stuff, right? There's not much you can do with that. We use a flex tool, and it just does that. There's not much to tune there. And then that, the result of flex goes in Python, which is a parser generator. And again, it's kind of hand waving past that here, because it just it does that. We don't need to deal, deal with that, right? This is standard stuff. We have a grammar description, which is pretty complicated, because SQL is a huge language compared to you know, like a programming language. It's usually only has a few things as part of its grammar. Right? There's a function call, has some expressions, and you define something, that's it, right? But SQL is basically all these, all the statements, they're all slightly different, right? There's no real common syntax. So every statement has its own grammar description, like create table, drop table, alter table, create operator, drop operator. All these things have to be in this grammar file. And so like update is like this or that way. So it's, it's huge, really, but you just pass it to Bison, and every so often, Bison doesn't handle it. It's, you know, there's some bug to be fixed. So if you use a very old Bison version, they can't even handle the grammar because it's too big. But other than that, it just works. So you feed in tokens, and out of the other end comes a, a parse tree. And the parse tree is basically in memory representation of, of your query. It's a bunch of C structs basically linked together. So it kind of looks like that. And this is kind of a YAML representation I made up of the parse tree. So the top level you have, well, at the very top level you have a list because you could have multiple statements. Right? You could be select something, semicolon, select something else. So it could be a list. And then you have a select statement. And the select statement has all these things. So Target those at the front clause, where clause, group by maybe, sort something maybe, maybe a few other things. The target list has a bunch of entries, and the front clause in our case has a join expression, and the join expression has you know, tables that feed into it in a join condition. And this is not you know, terribly complicated, it just has to be done. And so then you have this parse tree memory. And the parse tree. There is some syntax checking that goes in. So if you type nonsense, at this point, the parser will fail because it doesn't know what you did. But at this point, we don't know if this query makes sense yet because we haven't even looked if any of these columns and tables exist. So that's the next step. If you want to learn about this, and you, this is kind of interesting. I kind of got started this way because you don't really need to know anything about databases to play with that. This is all sort of standard. Standard tools and these kind of source files are kind of self contained. So, if you can read the documentation of Python and Flex, and pretty good documentation and these source files, then you will see how the parser and the Flex work. So, after that, we go into what's called a parse analysis. It's kind of the, the remaining part of the, the parser self directory. And this is where all the error checking happens. So, it goes through this parse tree and just checks everything. Does anything here make sense, right? It checks all these tables even there, all these columns there. Is, does this column belong to that table? Like, do all these functions exist? These types? <coughs> Is it allowed to put you know, the aggregates here and window functions there and, you know, relative to group by that you put in and all that stuff? You know? Uses, it looks up everything in the system catalogs. Yeah. If it wants to see if a table exists, it looks at the Gucci class. And if it wants to know if type exists, it looks at the Gucci type. And just, there's a whole lot of error checking here. 
this basically. So if you query, if you get an, if you get an error from your query that it says like syntax error, this is not valid. It probably comes from here. And then the result of that is basically a parse tree that has been slightly modified and then checked. Okay. So and then so here, here's a, a bit of an example of how that could work. Which is, I have sort of abstracted that a little bit, but we have this clause in our query that says where customers value age between 18 and 35. So first it would look, what does customer that age even mean? That could be, mean a bunch of different things, but then it figures out, okay, customers are probably the table name age is a column. Name. And then it looks up the age column has a type of E2. And then, so it says like, okay, we're gonna do it in between with an in two here. So how are we gonna do that? So first we look up in each type, the in two type. We get no ID back. OID sort of the Postgres internal number, ID number, right? For, for, you know, things. It turns out to be 21, and we have to look up an operator. In between itself is not an operator, right? Between means just greater than or equal, less than or equal. So, so it splits that up. And it looks up that in each operator, gets the code back, it gets the, the name of the procedure back because an operator is just uh, the implementation of the procedure. And then it looks into the proc <coughs> for that procedure and gets the source code, and this is the source code. So this is some C code that actually exists in Postgres or something like that. So, the nice thing about Postgres is all of this is kind of in user space. So I mean, you can extend it. You, know, you can, you know, as you probably uh, know, if you've used Postgres before, you can build extensions. And that means you can, you, know, you don't have to use the built in into type. This could be any type. And it would work the same way. It looks into these system catalogs. To, all, to do, you know, where, what type is it, what operator is this, what function is this, and then those other functions. It doesn't have to be built in C code, it could be something implemented in an extension in a different programming language. So all of this is extensible in Postgres. So, and this, this happens uh, during parse analysis when it goes through the parse tree and see what, what all these things mean. So once we're done with the parse, we go to something called a rewriter. And this is sort of an old academic part of Postgres in a way. It was one of the sort of research projects in the late 80s that they, uh, nowadays you would do this with triggers, but back then this was sort of the, the research idea to use rewrite rules. We could, based on these rules, rewrite a query to something else. And this turned out to be quite buggy and it's not really used anymore, but what we do use this for is to expand views. So if you have a view, it's kind of a, a macro expansion in a way. It just goes through the parse tree basically and says, oh here, it says table five, but that's actually new. So we're gonna take the new definition and just plot that in, in this place. And then you have to fix up all these reference and stuff so it can be a little complicated in, in general, but that's, roughly speaking, that's what it is for nowadays. It also does things like it plugs in defaults, so if you have an insert command, and you don't specify all the columns, it looks up the defaults, it plugs them in. So it just kind of fixes up your query, uh, your parse tree a little bit. So. And then it gets into the interesting part. So this is really the, like, why do you even use a relational database, right? One reason is, is probably you want to do all, like, all this transaction stuff, like the acid and, and transaction blocks and commit them and you want to make sure your data is safe and that kind of stuff. That's the one thing. The other thing is that you just type an abstract description of your query and it actually figures out how to do it. Right? This is sort of in sort of the, the 80s, uh, 1980s and 1990s, there was this sort of idea of fourth generation programming language, right? 4GL, you guys maybe heard of that. This was sort of the idea of so first generation was machine code, and second generation was assembly language, and third generation is what we now really think of as programming languages like you know, C and Ruby and Java, and all that kind of stuff, where you basically describe like do this and do this and do this, and if that, maybe do this or that. That's kind of how most programming works nowadays. And the fourth generation was then basically, I'm just gonna tell you what result I want, and you figure out how to do it. And this is really the <coughs> how databases 
database management systems earn their, their money, you just say, I want this from that table filtered this way, and then the planner figures out, like, okay, how am I going to even do that? How, what do I do first? What do I do next? And how do I make it fast? So that's what the planner is. It's kind of the, the terminology is, is sometimes mixed up. It's sometimes called the planner, sometimes called the optimizer. The, the source directory is called the optimizer, but I think we call it the planner nowadays. So that's, you know, <laughs> this is sort of, on one line there, I described really the meat of the, uh, the backend code. So like, it takes the parse tree that we just sort of figured out and embedded and make sure it makes sense. And then, then does its magic thinking, and then out there, the other end comes the execution plan. Right, and so for this query, the execution plan looks like this. And here, again, if you can't see in the back, it doesn't really matter what the specifics are. But it's basically a plan, like, how are we going to do this? Right, we had a query with it, which had the aggregation and the join and things like that. So, And in this case, OK, there's many options of how you could do this. But here, it decided at the top, okay, the, 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 so it kind of starts at the bottom. Right? But the, the last thing I'm going to do is the search. And it's the sort key. And then underneath the sort, I'm going to do an aggregation. And there's different ways you can do aggregation. So in this, in this case, it shows that we're going to do a hash to aggregation. And then as input to the aggregate, like we have to join. So in this case, it shows to do a hash. And then once you do the hash join, it has, has two tables as input. One is just a plain sequential scan, and the other one is the, the hash part of the hash join. So it actually does a sequential scan and then builds a hash table out of that in memory and then it does the other scan and this kind of hash job works. I don't, know. I'm not, don't want to talk about how all these plan types work today. There's this other sort of talks and literature about it. This is pretty standard stuff too that Postgres implements, right? All these different joint types and stuff. That's, that's not something that Postgres invented. That's the standard sort of database means. So how does it do that? That's not, we don't have time for how the plan works tonight. There's you know, other talks and, and a lot of uh, literature about that. But it basically takes two kinds of inputs. One is statistics from your tables. That's what vacuum and analyze collect. So, so they kind of know like how many, how many rows are in these tables, how big are these tables, what are the most common values in these tables. So that's one kind of information. And then the other type of information is cost parameters which supposedly model the hardware. Like how fast is it to go to disk versus go into memory? So it knows kind of the caching behavior of the hardware. How fast is it to do a sequential scan versus a random scan? And this could be different depending on what kind of hardware you have. Frankly, that most of these numbers are kind of bogus. But uh, so it's not really like it models the hardware. It just you kind of tweak those numbers until they work right. It's a bit more of it like that. Because it's really hard to model hardware really well. Like maybe in the really old days when they came up with this, you know, computers were simpler, but now there's so much caching going on and, and virtual memory and even the disks nowadays are not really disks anymore, right? They're just caching layers of <laughs> somewhere else, right? <laughs> Basically. So it, it, it is really hard to model that correctly, but it's a, at least that's a general idea. So in principle for for a complex query like this, there's a lot of possible plan types, right? You could do sorts, you could do the aggregation in a different way, you could do different joins. Maybe if you choose a if you choose a merge join here, it's already sorted, so you don't have to do the sort, so you have to figure out if I choose the merge join, I save the sorting later, but how much more expensive is the merge join going to be? How much memory do I have available? And then you can go to and like that a bit more memory and so on. So this is all that's happening here, right? So, and it, again, there, there could be a whole talk, a whole one-day training session about how this works. And this is really where, you know, if you have a performance problem, this is kind of where you start. So, Postgres source code, you know, has a lot of good readmes uh, around. So, it's kind of nicely organized into these subdirectories, right? The source back and parser, source back and rewrite, source back. Optimizer and that's readme, and they're, they're useful to read. They're really quite you know elaborate at the time. So if you just <laughs> if you want something to read, you can just take the Postgres source code and just look all the readme files and read them. That's a, that's a lot of good information there. Right? They're not just kind of silly. This is the final directory kind of things. Right? 
So, so do look those up if you're kind of interested in diving into this more. So to put this together a little bit, like how, where we are so far, and there's a, a few commands to interact with this pipeline a little bit. So the, the normal way is just in the middle from top to bottom. Right? You, you run a select or some other command, similar to select, you parse it first, and you do the rewriting maybe, and then you have the planner, and then we'll do some execution, which we'll talk about next, and then you sh ship back the result. But you can run some of these other commands and they kind of interact with this pipeline a little bit. So if you use prepared statements, you start with the parsing, but then when you have the plan, you, you stop there and you save the plan. Usually the plan is then saved in backup memory and you get like a handle back to your whatever programming API you use and then you can come back later and pass that handle to execute and it just basically continues there. Right? It fetches the plan back from memory and it continues there. It's really pretty simple. I mean, there's some memory management involved there to make sure this stuff uh, you know, doesn't get forgotten. But other than that, it's pretty, pretty much, it just you know, stops at the plan, saves it, and it resumes there. It's, that's what it does. So you do, you, you know, why use prepared statements? Yeah, you save the time to do that parsing and planning. Which is often not you know, all, that, all that big, but there, there are circumstances where planning is fairly expensive, so you want to save that. Okay. And then the explain commands that you use, and, and this kind of output here, this is actually explain output. I had to cut it down a little bit because a lot more details are usually printed from explain, but this is what explain prints. If you type explain, and for those of you who don't know what this is all, at all about, this is a, explain is a Postgres command. You write explain and then some command, and then this is basically what it does. It does parsing it, also rewriting it, planning, and then it just prints out the plan, and then it stops. And that's literally what it does. Right? It just it runs the planner, and then at the end of the planner, you have a plan tree, and then it just prints it out, and then it just looks like that. And then it's done. And if you run explain analyze, it will go on to the next step, execution. But instead of actually producing a real result, it will instrument the execution and collect some data during the execution and then ship that back. So that's a little bit more complicated, but that's basically where it is. So, Execution is back in the executor. There's a readme file in there. And it basically just goes through the plan that has been produced and, and executes it from top to bottom. And these are C functions that actually list like that. And there's a big switch or if statement somewhere in there that says, okay, what, what plan node do I have? Right? We have the first plan node was sort. Okay, so we're going to do sort. We're going to call exit sort. Was it? Yeah, in fact, his question was, does it start at the bottom? It actually, you're right, but it actually starts at the top. And the, 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 the first function sort of calls the next one and says, okay, give me one tuple. And this function, the next function calls the next one and says, okay, give me one tuple. And it kind of goes, to, it's kind of a pull system in a way. It says, give me one tuple. And of course, the sort can't actually do anything until it has all the tuples. So there's kind of a distinction there. But the, the basic idea is that there's sort of a driving, invisible driving agent up here that's like, give me one tuple. And then these functions are basically responsible for producing that tuple somehow. And then you sort of, sort of end up at the bottom there, the exit seeks span, which is then actually going to go to the disk and fetch one tuple. And in this case, it's probably going to do the whole seek span. Then the uh, exit hash is going to build the hash table. And there's some hash code at the side right, to actually do that. But so we build a hash table, and then the other seek then runs. And nowadays, some of these things can run in parallel, right? And we see those things And then the hash join actually does the thing, right? It does the seek scan, and then goes into the hash table and picks things up. So this is not super efficient, and there's actually like research going on or some implementation going on that to, to kind of change this model. Because this idea of, you know, give me one tuple and then give me the next tuple, and then it's sort of 
goes through these steps and goes back up these steps by every tuple, sort of theoretically. It's not very good in terms of CPU efficiency. So some, you know, maybe in a few years down, this might look quite different. And then uh, there's some experience now with like just-in-time compilation, with LLVM and that kind of stuff. That's sort of ongoing ideas now. But this is how it has been working for the last 20 plus years or so. So it basically just goes through this execution plan that has been produced, and each, for each node, it has a special function that actually executes that function. So there's a readme file. And so then, below the executor, we have the, what we call the access methods. That's actually where you do the dis Well, that's actually not quite where you do the dis access, but it's where you actually then do the sequential scans and where you do the index scans. And so in our case, we get a sequential scan. That's fairly simple. These are sort of API calls. Do the heap open, give it a lock level. Then you do begin scan, and then in some cases, you can put some keys in there for the filtering in a certain way. And then you, you have this call, leap get next. That's basically give me one tool, give me the next tool. Right? So it would kind of do that. When it starts the sequential scan, it would call this, you know, this open and stuff. But then for every tuple, we call give me one tuple, give me one tuple. Right? It's not super efficient in, in sort of in batch processing, like the gun and stuff would be better, but that's kind of the way the system works right now. And if you do, if you have an index scan, which we didn't have in this example, you would have that instead of heap, you would have index open, index begin scan, index get next. And then end and close to create resources. So this is all under source back end access for each uh, index method you have a subdirectory there. And this is then where the smarts are like, actually how does the B tree actually work? That's what's in there. The executor doesn't really know how the indexes work, it just, you know, it's been told like do this index scan. And it says, okay, open the index and go ahead. And then the index code does its B tree or magic or whatever. <laughs> the executor kind of just drives that through the, uh, the, the plant tree. So here are these sort of you know, for every index method. There's quite a few now in Postgres. There's you know, the standard B tree, hash, gist, gin. There's also the room filter index method now. There's the uh, space partition gist. And there's a bunch of things now for special use cases. So they all have their own implementation of whatever the index is actually supposed to do internally. But the API is kind of the same. It's an open index, give me it next to it. Pretty, so that way you can kind of extract out of that. And if you really want to go in deep into code, this is kind of cool stuff to read. Like, how does the B tree code actually work? That's, that's really good stuff. And this is how, this is how sequential scan works. Just, there's, there's, and this is kind of where it goes to this kind. In, the, in your data directory, this, there's kind of this directory structure of base, and then you have the number, which is the database ID, and then the next number is the table ID, and then you just have a file. And in each file is, is divided up into these 8K blocks. So it, it, every time it has to read a tuple, it actually has to fetch an entire block. So it can't just take one tuple, it has to read an entire block in any case, which it pulls into shared buffers. And then it kind of goes in there and decodes where is the tuple. It, it, there is sort of a very specific internal way these 8K blocks are constructed to fit all the tuples in there. And then when you update a tuple, it has to fit in there as well. And that comes up to it. There's some kind of internal fiddly things going on there. But basically, if you have a, a sequential scan, you just say, give me one block, decode, 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 send all the tuples back, give me the next block. There's some cache management going on, so you release that block so the next guy can look at that. So in a, in a, just if you have a heap scan, it just basically takes the blocks in order. And if it is an index scan, these blocks have different roles. They would then actually, in the case of a B tree, these would be the different sort of nodes of a B tree. 
so it's not quite in all the right <coughs> and have different roles and links between them, so it's not quite that simple. And in, or in, uh, in the case of a hash index, different blocks mean entirely different things. So, and uh, earlier we talked about uh, during the sort of the intro, the, the quiz, there was the question of how big can a table be? And this kind of has to do with that. that you basically take how large, and I don't have the math in my head now, but it's basically what is the size of a block number times the block size? Because it has to address this somehow, right? I mean, what, the, the reason block numbers have to exist is that the indexes point to the heap. So the indexes have links to the blocks in the heap, so they have to have a certain size of a block number. And then depending on how big you make the blocks, it's usually 8K, it could be changed, but it doesn't really, really does that. So that determines how big it is. It's almost an actually hit. So, and there's you know, partitioning you could do also if you really hit that limit. So, but it's, it's a pretty good limit. Speaking of that, question here? Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, so, speaking of partitioning or sharding, yeah. like, how does this algorithm differ if you're talking about data that's distributed? in different partitions or shards. How does this work with sh partitioning is the question. Um, basically, the way partitioning is implemented now, these are entirely unrelated tables at the storage layer. So you, if, you, if you do use the partitioning system that is new in Postgres 10, you get entirely the why, why, why would be different, basically. So those are entirely different tables on this. Just at a higher layer, they kind of stitch together them. And you query, it reads from all of them. So you're not affected by that. And this kind of, a whole lot of problems come out of that, which is why you can't, currently can't have indexes that go across a partition table, because then you would still need a different way of addressing blocks. And there's, we're thinking about different ways of doing that, but it's kind of a hard problem to how you address the table in that case, right? So, okay. Partitioning is not what? Not transparent as in the database. You need to write the code uh, to uh, segregate those. The question is, is partitioning transparent? The new partitioning in Postgres 10 is more like what you might be expecting, right? This kind of goes the deeper into, like, uh, if, you, if you're if you using the currently released Postgres 9.6 or earlier, you kind of have to stitch it together yourself. But in Postgres 10, there's going to be new partitioning that's uh, better. Yeah. So if you want to learn about this kind of storage, and that's kind of useful to know if you have any kind of corruption issues, right? That, that, you know, we always hope it doesn't happen, and, but it's, you know, it could be bugs in Postgres. Storage is fragile. The memory is sometimes fragile. Uh, mistakes happen. So it is kind of useful from time to time to look for corruption in storage. And there's a couple of tools you can use. Uh, well, one is a tool called PG File Dump, which is an external thing, um, a tool on GitHub, I guess it's now. Which basically, you give it, you point it to a block, and it tells you what's in the block. And then, if there's garbage in the block, it will kind of tell you. It says, like, okay, it's just junk in here. This, this kind of happens, right? So, blocks get all written by junk. File system messes up. It shouldn't happen, but it does happen. So this is what the uh, file dump can help you with. And contrib page inspect is a similar is a module that can tell you what's in the page. It kind of overlapping functionality a little bit. Uh, and contrib page inspect can also tell you, you know if it's a if it's a B tree page, what is in the B tree page, how many things of various things are in there. In a, in a hash index page, you know, many buckets and whatnot, is in there, that kind of stuff. So you can decode that information a little bit. So this can go quite deep in terms of debugging, but this is these are sort of good tools to have handy. And yeah, again, there's the source code directly where all this is happening. So this is you know along with you know the first thing to learn about in, 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 if you want to kind of go deep on Postgres is obviously reading plans and doing query tuning and things like that. But I think this might be sort of the next thing in terms of 
being able to handle corruption and that kind of stuff, so that, that's, that's kind of useful to look into. And then there's sort of a, a thing at the side, and we, our, we just had a select creator, so this doesn't actually happen, but if you have an update, for example, so instead of heap, you know, get next and do a sequential scan, you would call heap update if you run an update. You know, first it would get the tuple, and then it would do, apply the changes in memory, and then we call heap update, which actually just uh, um, writes back to disk. But before that can happen, uh, we uh, have to do write ahead logging to be able to recover in case of a crash, right? This is the sort of the principle of, of write ahead logging or journaling, as it's sometimes called in other systems. Like that. So this is kind of how this happened. And these are again C function calls. That uh, the heap update, before it actually does its thing, is called log heap update, which composes a, a, a description of the change, sort of a byte encoded description of what it's doing, and then passes it off to xlog insert, which writes it off to the wall. And everywhere in the code you make change, uh, the changes written, this this happens. Right? There's, I just checked this uh, yesterday, there's you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of XLOG insert calls all over the place. So everywhere a change is being written, an update is written, copy command, all these places that where any any time you write to disk, you have to do an XLOG insert first to write to the right hand. And the right ahead log is kind of its own thing, and it's here, this uh, source code. It's kind of all in one file, so we can file that experiences. So yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how this works. This is kind of how our query is processed, right? It kind of starts this way. You have PSQL, which just takes your input, passes it off to libpq. So, libpq knows what the protocol, so it gets sent over the protocol. There's some parsing going on, there's some system catalog and the planner. Executor and executor have all these side functionality. It knows about the sorting and the hashing, where the types are, and things like that. And access methods. They know how to write to the heap. Before you write to the heap, you can do you have to do write-head logging. Then, as you might know, in Postgres, from the write-head logging, then all this replication stuff also happens. If you if you if you log if you write a log to the disk that that contains the description of your changes, you can just take that description of the changes and replay it somewhere else, and then you have replication. So that's where all that replication stuff also comes in. And then below that. Something that's not often talked about is called a, something called a storage manager. And there's currently only one storage manager. And uh, the, at some point in the 1980s, they probably thought there should be different storage managers. And uh, the one storage manager they have now is, is in a source, card, source file called md.c, which then for magnetic disks. So yeah. they said, like, OK, we're going to have one storage manager for magnetic disks. And then if any other kind of disks show up, we're going to make another storage manager, which never happened. So. This is kind of the, the level of thinking that was going on at that point. So, and every once in a while, there's discussions of different storage methods. Like if you think about something like column storing, right? like that's something that's interesting for like big data kind of stuff sometimes. And there's always sort of the debate of where do you actually fit this in? Is it like would this be a new storage manager? Would this be a new access method? Would it replace key? Was it always the same key, just different? So this is kind of the debate. We don't have a solution to that, right? This is going on, been going on for years, really. Every time someone says, like, okay, we're going to implement home store, or maybe another storage manager of some kind, where does it really fit in? Is it, is it storage manager? Is it a heap? Is it an access method? How do we do that? We don't. This is sort of the debate. Like, what is the level of uh, the correct level of abstraction? Okay. So again, if you want to try a few things, uh, so the best thing is to study the source code and become a seasoned Postgres hacker. But if you don't quite have time for that, uh, explain, explain, and analyze are obviously super useful tools for any kind of performance problems. That's where you start. If you have a performance problem, you get any kind of help, be it on a mailing list or an IRC or professional help of some kind. They're always going to ask first for your plan plan, or your plan, analyze plan, more likely. So that's where you have to start trying to understand that. 
TCP DAM is useful if you're sort of the network type, but PG file DAM and PG wall DAM to understand maybe file issues, corruption issues, those are useful to have handy if you need to do that. And then uh, studying extensions is useful if you just want to know how the externals work a little bit. So there are extensions that define new data types or new functions. If you just take those and try to understand how they work, they're kind of smaller than the whole Postgres source code, right? But they kind of tie into a lot of these things. So you just grab an extension and see how that works, and you, you, you can also uh, to learn a lot, a lot of things about how these things fit together. So, today is what, Tuesday, right? So Thursday, Postgres 10 is coming out. Yeah, thank you. Up to date thing, right? So, we have yearly releases, we changed the version numbering a little bit. So, the last one was 9.6, now it's 10, next one's going to be 11 next year. So, if you check that out as you know, logical application. Lots of more parallel stuff, new partitioning, I just mentioned briefly. I'm not going to go into the details of that. There's other talks about that out there on blogs and things like that. So that's uh, coming soon, so please uh, check that out if you want. Our conference again is also New York uh, Postgres, New York City Postgres Girl user group. If you want more of that, it's on Meetup. It's also in April going to be a big conference in Jersey City at FusionCon US. So lots of Postgres content is still around uh, the city, this area. So please check those out. And that is the end of my presentation. I, you know, it's just almost 8 o'clock. I guess we can take maybe one or two questions if there are any. So I guess we'll start. Uh, I'm just talking to the evaluate. <laughs> I'm going to repeat it for the microphone. I just started to evaluate Postgres SQL and I was reading upon it and went to the documentation, but also I came upon, upon a, an article about Uber. Yeah. So why they Uber article. Uh, yes. The Uber article was mostly had a good had a few good points and we're trying to address them, but it was also wrong in a bunch of points. So that was not that's not the article I would really evaluate from. Yeah. So I can give the details later. Maybe. But is there uh, is that really true when you update a secondary index? If you kind of go on updating all the tuples for the that, if you update an index, you update somewhat. Yeah, that's a problem. If if you if you have if you update the tuple, you have to update all the indexes that went to the tuple up to some optimization. So we try to make that work. That that that's, that could be a problem. A lot of the other things in that article were not quite correct. So it kind of there are some follow-ups and rebuttals to that, so please read those as well. I, I yeah. that, that is not going to fix the entire uh, You talk about some bits of the process involved, like code that was written in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So how does the project manage technical debt? How does the project manage technical debt uh, with code written in the 80s? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an ongoing problem, right? We, um, you just have to gradually try to clean things up. But you know, we, we try to run on like, old operating systems too, and sort of non-mainstream operating systems. So you have to maintain compatibility, and that's uh, that's a, that's a struggle. It's kind of like developing consensus, like what operating systems and what old compilers can be abandoned. But it's been it's been uh, getting better lately. But yeah, you got to be really aggressive, and there's like no glory really of deleting old code, there should be more glory for that. Like, you know, deleting code and cleaning up code and yeah. But that, that's kind of hard, that's a struggle. Yeah. But you gotta kind of just uh, force yourself to do a little bit of that every so often. Question over there. Uh, is it possible to make master master repl replication? Is it possible to do master master replication for uh, Yes. It is possible not with the built-in stuff, but there's an extension called BDR, just developed by my colleagues at Tech Department. It does work. Uh, just be careful with the use cases. It's not really HA, it's more like for distributed, like geographically distributed things. So, if anyone wants to know more about any details, I got a few business cards here. 
get in touch with me if you want to know about BDR replication stuff about Postgres. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll conclude here. Eric, do you want to say final words here, or how's it, how's it going? Uh, let's take a few more questions. More questions? OK, I don't yeah. know what the time constraints is here. Then we'll take all the questions. <laughs> Uh, who's got our hands up? Yeah. Is there any particular features coming down the pipe that would, that's interesting? Are there any particular features <laughs> coming down the pipe that are interesting? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think 10 was kind of a, 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 a new sort of milestone in the way that we have now a lot of groundwork for more things to come, like parallelism. There's a lot more stuff that could be parallel. Uh, partitioning could be a lot better in terms of you know, global indexes and all these stuff we kind of briefly chat about. So there's probably a lot more like that. Logical application that I mentioned that could be improved in all kinds of ways, including in, in, uh, integrating multi-master functionality that's currently external. So there might not be like a, a brand new super novel feature in the next year or two, but certainly there's a lot of room for improving and expanding on what's currently been uh, recently been put in. So I think that's sort of my expectation there more. Yes, please. Wait, before we take the next question, I just want to remind everyone we are giving away a Raspberry Pi oh, yes. kit. And the bowl to put your cards in is right where that guy, yeah. If you could just pass that around the room one more time, because once we're done with QA, we're giving that away. So last chance, put your business card in there. If you don't have a business card, just make one on a piece of paper and put, put it in that bowl. All right, question there. Hi. Um, I recently got into what you might call static analysis of large of Postgres code. Um, and so I was wondering if you could point me in the obvious about Google these tools, the types of for that. Any directions you can point to? Any directions for what kind of tools? Um, tools for analyzing Postgres code, particularly things like data flow. Analyzing the code for data flow. Yeah. Um, we do use Kerberity and LLVM scan build for sort of uh, you know, static analysis for bucket checking. So those are the kind of two tools I know that we use. Uh, other than that, I, I don't really know. Okay. No? Okay. Question here? Yeah, and with regards to distributed systems, mm -hmm. um, how does Postgres out of the box handle conflict resolution? Well, Postgres by itself is not a distributed system, so it doesn't do that. Uh, there are, you know, the BDR, what I mentioned, which would do multi-master logical application, has you can configure what to do with conflicts. And there's a couple of options, like you know, by timestamp, by origin. There, you can write custom handbars. Uh, so that's basically that. There's also something called Postgres XL, which is a sort of a, how would you describe that? It's sort of a bunch of nodes that appear as one logical node. So I guess there's not really conflicts in that case because everything has sort of local transaction awareness. So there's a couple different sort of extensions or quasi force of Postgres that do these different things there. Has everyone had a chance to put their card in? Yes? Can I put my right, last question? Oh, no. no. <laughs> the people in the back come up here, put it in, and we'll take your last question and we'll give away the question. Yeah, last question, question there. Is Postgres Excel web scale? Uh, Mason, what do you think? Is Mason still here? Did he leave? No, we have the author of Postgres. Mason Sharp. Did he just leave? I just saw him a moment ago. We should have asked him because he was the original author of that. Uh, now, Postgres XL is, uh, is is quite cool. It's not so sort of, uh, mainstream, but it, it does. It, it's really cool, right? You just give it more nodes and it runs you know, by that amount faster if you can uh, distribute your data that way. Um, but it, I guess it's mostly sort of analytical processing. It's not really necessary for transactions, but it could do that. Better. OK, more questions. Yeah, let's, let's do these two then. Sure. Um, I have a question in regards to um, use cases. Where we're scenarios where Postgres is being used as a data store to pull data from things like uh, specific blockchains like Ethereum. Have you heard of any of these? Postgres to pull data from what kind of thing? Uh, for the for Ethereum blockchain. Um, if to pull from uh, blockchains, no, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about that, no. 
that is interesting because it's basically a blockchain. It's kind of a database in itself, right? But I, I don't know anything about the. I, I have not heard of that kind of use. Should we do the last one? Yeah. 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 Um, it's it, to me, it's it's pretty confusing, you know, presentation. Actually, uh, I don't quite understand. Uh, in the time of highly distributed systems, MPP databases, Hadoop, and you know everything which is happening, who really cares about the uh, old plain relational databases? But even even if people do, why to expose all of this? Code written in C style in the 80s or 90s. <laughs> why, why? Why did you choose that thing? It's like the same thing. that somebody from IBM will come and show us the code for ZOS that they developed in '69, and, and we will look at this. But you know, how is it relevant to current times? Three queries. Um. That is a good question, yes. There is sort of, I can answer this in two ways. One way is, I don't really know, but people do use it, and I serve them. I mean, that's one way to do it. And the, the other way is, you can, you, can, you can think about it, you know, enumerate, you know, compared to System X, how is a relational database uh, of advantage? And, you know, I, I like things like strong typing, data integrity, Perhaps ease of operation, you know, strong transaction guarantees. Not just you know, it is a transaction, but transaction like full transaction serializability, for example, and, and transactional integrity in replication and things like that. So there are a lot of things going for it, and in a way, uh, you know, business has, has been better than ours, so people seem to agree. But I know this is an ongoing discussion, and we continue to have it, but. So far, we seem to be on the right side here. <laughs> that controversial ending. Yeah. I'd like to give a great big round of applause to Peter Eisentraut. <laughs> Can I ask you to just mix it all up? Someone looks like they wrote it on a piece of toilet paper. <laughs> Can I ask you, look that way, reach in and pull one out. The, the, the balls over here. She's really not looking at you. Uh, no, read it out. Uh, that has no information on it. I said make a business card, not write your first name only. We're, that person doesn't win. Next one, reach in, grab another one. No, you forever. Oh, wow. See, that's a real business card. <laughs> Vlad Stednik? Stednik? Vlad Stednik? Stednik? Vlad Stednik? Wow. Somebody? No, all right. He, he lost no. out. No? No Vlad's here. Okay, grab another one out. Throw back here. Oh, look at me. That's another one. No, no, no. We need a card. We need a card. We're on a roll here. You picked the same one twice. Yeah, okay. Try again. I'm going to take this one out. Maybe I'm not a good picker? Oh, wow. Here we go. That's a real card. Okay. Uh, ben Morrison? Oh. All right. Ben Morrison. Thank all right. you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Peter is here for one-on-one -on -one questions. Feel free to come up now and ask. <laughs>